Hey guys, Uri here. This week we have a special video to announce my new upswing course, the Poker Blueprint that's releasing at the end of next month. We're going to do a series of four videos. This is part one. It's a little different, but I really think you'll like it. Let me know what you think and make sure to keep an eye out on Upswing's channel in the coming weeks for some more info about the course and some vids leading up to the course release. So this is going to be about characteristics of a top poker player. Now, being a professional poker player can be quite tough. There's something about the nature of poker that's different from other professions. So you're a doctor or a lawyer and you run into a bad stretch. There's a body of material that you can rely on and there are ways to measure your skill. But due to the nature of the game in poker, there are going to be these periods of time during which you lose money and more importantly, you lose confidence. And after you've been losing for months, people start to ask themselves, am I still a winning player? And was I ever a winning player? Or just a donkey on a lucky streak? And there are so many intangibles in this game that it's very, very tough to measure. It's very tough to measure if what you're doing is actually good or not good, other than the results. Now, if I am just a donkey on a lucky streak, I better stop playing as soon as possible before all my money is gone. At least if you're responsible, some people will just bet all the money till the money's gone. But these thoughts and feelings, either way, they have a very negative effect both on your poker game and on your personal life. Now, over the years, I've worked with players in these situations and I've told a lot of them they had nothing to be worried about, that they had everything it takes to succeed even though nothing had been going for quite a few months, no money made and no end in sight. And many of these guys ended up becoming some of the best in the world. So what did I see in them that made me so sure? Number one, integration. So an example springs to mind from early in my poker career. I was watching a friend play, and he was facing a river decision with a bluff catcher against a big bet. And I was still learning from this guy, and he told me, I think this is a clear call. And I said, why? You know, can't he have a queen, pocket kings like all the hands that beat you? And then he said something that, that completely shocked me. He said, no, he can't. I don't think he can have those. He bet the flop really, really slow. I think a queen would have bet a lot faster. What I realized was happening is that this guy, as the hand was going on, was picking up data points, storing them in his head, and he had, like, real-time integration, so he had a very accurate picture of his opponent's range and what could and couldn't be in it. When his opponent made this big bet, which, you know, without all these tiny data points, sure, he could have ace-queen, but if you kind of rule that out, suddenly it's only bluffs left. And people are able to do this are generally able to very accurately assess where they are in a hand. Now, here there was an example of timing, but even without timing, keeping very good track of ranges sometimes means that you can value bet. Raise or thin like fourth pair on the river, or turn trips into a block, realizing that it's not good, it's the bottom of your range, etc. I'll explain how this is done and then give you guys an example. So we start with preflow. What sizing was opened, but also which player, which position, who are the other players at the table? Now you visualize a group of hands, and which hands are in it is actually less important than what's at the borders, which hands aren't making it in. Because, you know, someone just check raised you on queen 9 6. Can he have queen 9? Can he have 9 6 suited? Can he have 7 8 off suit? Can he have queen 6 suited? All of these things are going to play a big factor in your decision if you're aware of them. And he might just be looking at the flush draw, your opponent, and not worrying about these too much. But since people aren't computers, if you worry about them and if you catch the nuances, you can often catch people with their pants down, so to speak. So, this thought process continues throughout the hands. Was there a bet? How big? Ranges get narrower. The turn comes. And these guys are able to keep a clear image of this in their mind over multiple tables for long periods of time. Now, if this is an ability you have, cherish it, and if it's not, aspire to develop it the best you can. Now we're going to go with an example. Okay, so this hand was played on GG Network 100-200 between Alex and Artem, both of these guys. Successful high stakes regs, 20k buy-in. Alex raises on a cutoff to 2.5x standard size and Artem calls from the big blind. So already try to imagine the ranges and, and ask yourselves, how good are you guys at this? 
does Artem have king nine off? Does he have king eight off? Does he have queen do suited? Like, where do the borders lie? Artem checks, we have king seven, six, two tone. This is one of those boards where even though the preflop raiser has an advantage, the caller hits sixes and sevens and king seven suited, king six suited, six seven. So he has enough kind of top range hands where the in position player can't go crazy betting everything. Alex makes a half pot bet, which generally speaking is indicative of what we call a polarized range. So he's not betting absolutely everything, but doing some kind of merge with stronger weights to his good hands and more check backs with hands like, you know, pocket queens, pocket jacks, pocket fives would be the classic example. So yeah, we have a bet and a call, turn deuce of diamonds, deuce of diamonds. You know, whenever a draw comes in, in general, it has a, call it a depolarizing effect because generally speaking, when Alex bets the flop, Artem's going to check raise most of his good hands. And then on a bricky turn, Alex is going to have the kind of top range that Artem doesn't anymore, given most of his top hands check raised. And that creates a difference in the tops of the ranges. But once draws come in, top of the range is no longer a set or a top air top kicker. It's now flushes and both players can have flushes. So this leads to generally speaking, smaller bet sizes. So Artem checks, Alex bet 75% pot, and Artem goes for a check raise, which Alex calls. Now, with no theory, what's Artem check raising? Well, generally flushes and flush blockers, right? Maybe sets, but generally the check raising range is centered around the new top range. Just like on the flop, you check raise sixes. On a turn, you can check raise some flushes. And then the appropriate hands to go with that would be hands with one diamond as bluffs. So river three of diamonds and we get a shuffling of the cards for yet another time in the hand. This is a very difficult hand to keep track of ranges. And here Artem goes for a check. Why does he go for a check? Well, generally, if you look at his range, a lot of his flushes are now no longer worth as much money because it's four to a flush. All of his bluffs made a flush, but not necessarily a high one. So the range has got re-depolarized again, and he might actually be at a bit of a disadvantage. So he actually goes ahead and checks, and Alex goes all in. Now, try to pause the video and think about what is Alex's range, and which hands should he be bluffing with, or could he be bluffing with? Now, if I dropped you on this spot with no background and I told you, look at your hand, decide whether or not you're going to bluff, and you saw something like top pair or two pair in Alex's shoes, you would be, no, I mean, those are not hands that I bluff. Let's check these hands back. I bluff with air. I, I don't bluff top pair. I don't bluff two pair. But if you guys kind of roll back to the turn in Artem's check raising range, Artem is basically going to have a flush almost always on the river. And if he doesn't have a flush, he certainly has a one pair hand beat. All his bluffs are going to have a diamond. All his value hands are generally speaking flushes. So how does Artem not have you beat if you have one pair? Let this sink in for a second and now look at your six, seven of clubs and say, okay, if I check, I'm actually going to lose a hundred percent of the time. My 6-7, my 2 pair, is just as good as if I had 9-4 offsuit. Not even as good, because maybe my 9-4 randomly has a diamond. To realize this, you have to keep very, very good track of the ranges. So that's why I think this hand illustrates very strongly the concept that I'm trying to drill in this video. This is something that top players are very, very, very good at. And you can see it as they're moving up stakes, and they don't have to get it accurate. Sometimes they miss by a bit but they keep track and this is something they kind of do naturally. So in this hand, Alex goes all in, Artem makes the call, Artem has ace of diamonds, six of diamonds for the nuts. So easy call, very naturally played hand. Check all the flop, check raise a turn with the nuts. And he recognized that this is a river where he needs to play more defensively with his range, kind of babysit all of his low flushes because he's going to have a lot of them. So yeah, easy hand for Artem. What about Alex? Alex shows up with king of hearts, seven of hearts. So flop bet makes sense. Turn bet makes sense. Although you could also check back on a flush. It's not that strong. And then this is a type of hand that calls a check raise. And the way you think about it is 
you know, if he's bluffing, you have him beat, but if he has a flush, you have four outs to a boat. So kind of like calling with a all pair plus got shot pipe hand value, because you have four outs to, to the nuts. So definitely a turn call. And then on the river, I think Alex correctly recognized that his hand has zero showdown value and, and thus makes for a potential bluff and made a very, very sharp bluff. And whenever I see someone make this kind of bluff, I take a note that this is going to be a tough guy to play against. He's very range aware. He's capable of turning showdown into a bluff in appropriate spots. And the reason I'm saying this is that a lot of people aren't, and people who aren't, you play against them different. Yeah, that's it for this video. Tune in for the next one, where we discuss another trait of top poker players. Hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you next time.